Hi, Michael Herzog with the American Awakening here. Glad you stopped in. Hey, while you're here, let me ask you. Uh, I was just sitting here looking at my emails, and I'm counting just since 5 o'clock this morning to what time is it now here? It's almost noon. I've got one, two, three, four, five, six advertisements advertising uh, for me to go back and get a better education. Let me read them to you. Um, addiction counseling. If your goal is addiction counseling, earn a degree in counseling. Uh, study criminal justice. Hey, friend, learn to protect your community with a degree in criminal justice. Or Kaplan University. You may be eligible for a scholarship. Teaching elementary school. Learn about elementary teaching courses. University of Phoenix. Earn your degree while you earn a living. Now, you know, we've all been taught from an early age, from the time we went to school, that you're not going to have a successful and fulfilled life unless you get a college degree. We've heard this from our parents, from our teachers, from, from all walks of life. But in this day and age, it seems like this is becoming big business. And this is the, uh, this, the topic of my program today. Now, for those of you who don't know me or for, who just tuned in, uh, and I'm sure you wouldn't know unless you were already tuned in, uh, I have a website called theamericanawakening.org. I did seven years on uh, alternative radio with uh, Republic Broadcasting Network, with uh, Oracle Broadcasting Network, We the People Network. Uh, got my inaugural start on uh, KFNX in Phoenix, Arizona. And I went off the air on March 9th. All my archives are in the, uh, the website, theamericanawakening.org, and you can go back and listen to some of my previous shows. But what I did was I got off the air, uh, Oracle closed down, and... Uh, we decided to shift gears and put this up in a format so you could put a face with the voice. And that's what I'm doing here today. Now, this is my inaugural show today. We're going to be doing shows in the future, hopefully once a week, possibly more, on all kinds of different topics to basically keep America awake. And if you're not already awake, that's what this format is uh, in tune to do. So with that, the, the topic today is just that. It's college degrees in the American educational system and what is happening. I have a guest coming on today uh, by the name of Jessica Clowers. Now, she's also going to be uh, my co-anchor for a lot of these upcoming shows, and she's also going to be a field reporter. So I'm really excited to have her. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to spend the next, oh, I don't know, half hour or so. She's got an article up on my website in the blog. So if you want to go in there and read it in full, but well, we're going to be talking about this article today and her experience and what happened to her in the college educational system. So I think you'll find it very informative. Stick around. We're going to break. When we come back, I'm going to have Jessica Clowers sitting next to me. Thank you. Thank you for sticking around through the commercial break. And I'd like to take this time to introduce you to Jessica Clowers. Jessica, welcome to the American Awakening. Thank you. Okay. You know, um, it's interesting. I went through and I read this article, and I thought, you know, the, the public needs to know about this because it really is an overview of your journey through the educational system. So I want to start out by asking you, um, and by the way, folks, you can go into the blogs on theamericanawakening.org and read it for yourself. Obviously, I'm not going to read the whole article, but I've got Jesse here to give me an overview of exactly what happened during that point in time. And so, Jesse, there, there, let's start this by just saying there came a time when you were kind of despondent about where you were going in life. And as I read through the article, um, uh, you were basically, well, at a downside. 
in, in life and looking for something better to do. Um, and so ultimately, I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail about this, but you started going online and filling out what they call squeeze pages right. um, of uh, uh, different colleges and so forth. And you specified in your article, you at the time, you didn't have a job. Right. You didn't have any credit. Okay, your, uh, your credit, as, if it's like mine has been in the past, wasn't very good. <laughs> was at its worst, for okay. lack of better words. For, uh, at its worst, <laughs> for lack of a better word. Okay, so, so you filled out uh, a few of these squeeze pages online, and I was just mentioning before the break that I had in my email account, just since 5 o'clock this morning, six advertisements from different colleges around the country. So let's start from you filled out a couple of squeeze pages, and within a half hour, what happened? I got a phone call. Okay. And who was on the other end of the line? It was an enrollment advisor from the University of Phoenix. An enrollment an advisor. Enrollment. Okay. Yes. I want you to hold on to those terms, folks. <clears throat> enrollment advisor. All right. And so the enrollment advisor basically spoke with you about what? Your thoughts, plans, beliefs? What did, what did he do? Actually, he started the conversation like a friend of mine would. Uh, when he called, he asked me what my interests were, um, kind of got into my background, my hobbies, my interests, what I like to do on the side for fun. Didn't really focus on education at that point in time. And, and how much time would you say that he spent just doing fluff or, you know, just surface conversation? A good 10 minutes or so. 10 minutes or so. Okay. And at some point then, then he shifted gears. And did you ever at any point uh, feel like that he was giving you any kind of a sales pitch? No. No. Okay. No. Uh, you, 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 did you feel like you were talking to more of a friend? Somebody was trying to help you uh, make a decision in life? Is that what happened? Yeah. I mean, he seemed like he was interested in learning more about who I was as a person as opposed to trying to get me into college. Okay. And so with that, I'm, I'm assuming that, that you felt like, yes, this person was here to help you. And based on the, on the fact that you were at a kind of a crossroads in life, you elected to take his advice, which was to do what? It was to do an associate's program in elementary education. And what part of that, I mean, when he was talking to you about the associate's program, Department of Education, you had shared with him stories about past jobs and so forth. And what exactly was it that he had told you that you could do once you had that degree? I could pursue any career in the educational field. Okay. Okay, so let's fast forward just a little bit here. Because uh, I know, and I, I've got the article in front of me, folks. You can follow along with me on the AmericanAwakening.org um, and go to the blogs and follow along here. I'm, I'm at the part where it's in the associates program. And you, you mentioned here at the start of that, you said, I'm a college student. You were excited. I was. <laughs> <laughs> it was very exciting. So, so now all of the stress is alleviated. You're, you're worried about what to do with the rest of your life. Now, I'm assuming you have a goal in mind. I do. You do. Okay. Yes. Because he had this enrollment advisor, had, had painted a rosy picture that, uh, you know, once you, you got through your associate's degree, then everything was going to be fine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, you're a college student now. I want to ask you, where was the money coming from? I mean, why, how was it that he said, you know, I read in the article here, you're talking about, well, I didn't have any money. I don't know how I'm going to do that. What did he say to evidently make you realize that you didn't need any money, you didn't need any credit? What, what happened there? I didn't have to worry about it because I qualified for student loans and um, financial aid. You qualified for student loans and financial aid and you didn't have a job and you didn't have any credit. Right. Okay. Now, I, I, I want to interject something here, folks. Now, anybody that's ever gone out and tried to buy a house, a car, a TV, whatever on time, we all know that you've got to have some semblance of credit. You have to have a credit score of, you know, depending on what you're buying, you know, 620, 650, 680. Do you have any idea what your credit score was at the time, Jesse? 420. 420. <laughs> a 420 credit score, and she's got loans to go to school. Now she, now you don't have to worry about working. Okay. You can focus your entire committed studies to whatever it is that's going to allow you according to the financial, or not the financial advisor, but the, 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 what is his name? Enrollment, Enrollment counselor. 
once you get through all of this, well, basically the sky's the limit. Is that right? That's correct. Okay, so let's shift gears here a little bit. Now you're in school. You're a college student, okay? You're happy-go-lucky. All the stress is relieved. You are, you are basically getting input and being assisted by funding through the government to help you. Am I right so far? Yeah. Okay. Now, one day, <laughs> let's see. You got a warning letter from the university. And by the way, we're putting a document up on the screen here, folks, so that you can read while we're speaking. That you were in violation of the student code of conduct, uh, conduct because you allegedly plagiarized an assignment. Yeah. Tell us about that. You know, when you sit down to write a college paper, I mean, you're looking at anywhere from 700 words, 1,000 word, 1,200 word paper. And it can be very taxing at times, depending on what the topic is. So, you know, I sat down and I did my research and wrote my papers just like I thought they should be written. And I ran it through. Their, um, they have a what's called a right point and a plagiarism checker on the student website. Mm -hmm. And that's where you check your grammar and you check for any kind of plagiarized material. And they all came back. You know, I, I had grammar errors just like anyone else would. But the plagiarism, it has a percentage. And it will show you where your errors are as far as... Oh, you had a 3% error because you have, you know, the radio was in the sentence that somebody else had written on the internet. So you got to reword things and it can be very difficult. Uh, well, okay, you know, as, it go, as you go through on the Associates Program, you also mentioned that even though you were putting it through this, uh, I guess, what is it, plagiarism check or something yes. on the computer, you continually were receiving those all the way through your Associates degree. Which, am I right there? I mean, not I, all the way through, but I got about four warning letters during yep. the course of two years. Okay. Yeah. I'm assuming for that, that once you've got the first one, and pay close attention to this, folks, because anybody that, that is thinking about or has children that are thinking about enrolling in one of these programs, this is what this show is all about, is to educate you folks and warn you of what's out there and what some of these people are doing. Now, getting back to what I was talking about, so the four times during the course of your two years in uh, your associate's degree, you were getting these warnings. So I would assume that you were likely walking on eggshells with this. If you were going in and checking the plagiarism and so forth, the, the, the boxes, you were literally always on edge thinking that somebody was going to come back with something to cause you distress or harm and you had written in here something along the lines of it was going to cost you additional money they could terminate you or whatever okay am i correct there uh, very correct okay yes. so with that let's see let me move on here in the whole during the whole course of this time you're under the 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 thought pattern that while you're going to school you're excited, you're going out and applying for a job, you're telling people that, yay, you know, you've updated your resume to where you're a college student now, and you're thinking that all this time this is going to be great, and, you know, the doors are open to you. Definitely. Definitely. Okay. So, <laughs> I'll read a couple of excerpts here. I spent the next year, and these are your words, Jessica, I spent the next year searching for jobs or rapidly coming closer to broke. Uh, you had reached a point where you were literally no longer picky about what you were going to do for an income because you had a child to feed and bills to pay. And it says you had hit the streets, driven to every shopping center you could find, putting in 30 or 40 hours a week just looking for a job. If now, not more. Yeah. Okay. And, and with that, uh, tell the audience, you know, ha holding down a 40-hour job is difficult enough. But spending the time, energy, gas, uh, undergoing the stress, doing the... the you know, online applications, resumes, and so forth. Would you say that that endeavor is as difficult, if not more difficult, than actually having a job? I would really say it's more difficult than having a job. I mean, at least when you have a job, nine to five, you know where you're going the next day. Um, you have a location. You go to your location for business, and you put in your eight hours work or whatever it is. When you're out there looking for a job, you're spending money that you don't have to put in your gas tank to drive around mindlessly, not knowing where you're going. And even though, you know, if you have a 40 hour job, you have your good days, you have your bad days, you may be under stress, you may have other you know, personal things going on in your life. But when you don't have a job, 
not only that, but you also have to continually motivate yourself. Because I know, folks, I've been there. I've gone through this many times. You have to consistently motivate yourself and keep yourself up and always be on your best behavior just to get that interview or to just land that job if you do get an interview, right? First impressions are everything. First impressions, yes. Okay, so with that, now, folks, this is, I'm just building this in here because it gets better. I'm going to read a couple more excerpts here, and I want you to share with us, because you were going through a two-year associate's degree. You were still out actively looking for a job, not having any luck at all in finding one. Right. Right? Okay. So, I'm going to read to you an excerpt of what you said here. As my graduation date was approaching, I got another call from an enrollment advisor. Once again, another friendly, helpful voice on the other end of the line. Now... You say you went on to say it's the same routine as it was before, and ultimately you took that time to share with her, which I'm not going to do on this interview, but uh, you can again you can go ahead and read it back in the the, uh, the full article, folks. But you gave her kind of an earful as to what you had experienced over the two years getting your associate's degree, and now it's coming to time where you're 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 going to get that degree, and tell us what she said. Well, which part? <laughs> <laughs> the part where she advised you to continue your education. Yes, I was at the point where I wasn't going to go for an associate's degree in elementary education anymore. Um, some things had happened, and I had a change of heart. I didn't really know what I wanted to do, but I just knew I wanted to help people. And her and I had this conversation. And she advised me in a bachelor's degree in psychology. A bachelor's in psychology? Yes. Okay, now, let me ask you this at this point. The call that you got from this enrollment advisor, was, was there any trigger that tripped? Was there a penny that dropped in your mind? Did you think it was kind of odd or coincidental that this woman just happened to call you right close to the time where you're about ready to graduate? At that point in time, I was only two years into college, and I was still ignorant, quite honestly. Okay. Um, so this isn't where the penny dropped? No. Okay. All right. So let me put a check mark here. <laughs> okay. Uh, but she advised you to continue your education, and she also went on to say, and, and, and the, the, the excuse she used or the reasoning that she used to push you into this was, she says, and I quote here, uh... She said, to continue your education with a different course of study as it would be silly to have an associate's degree that you will never use. And besides, if you still do not have a job, how are you going to start paying back those student loans in six months? Well, that was logical, wasn't it? Yeah. So, so with that in mind, based upon the fact that you didn't have a job, you thought, okay, well, I can do this. And uh, uh, she had a good point, you say, and that, that she also basically said, the sky's open to you. If you have a bachelor's degree, you pretty much do anything you want to do. Well, right. employers go after people with a four-year degree, you know, not a two-year degree. Okay. Um, so with that, now, at this point, you have no inclination that there's any kind of a agenda there, any kind of a, you know, sales pitch going on. Not at all. Not at all. I thought that was their job. You know, here you are getting ready to graduate with your associate's degree. Their job is to make sure that you have your education that you want, right? So they're going to call you to make sure that you have fulfilled everything that you wanted. And if not, you know, they're going to advise you on where to go next. And that's their job. Okay. All right. So now, so you, you pull the trigger, you make the decision. Now you're going for a bachelor's degree. You've got another two years and you're thinking, okay, well, once I do that, the, the sky's kind of the limit. Yeah. All right. So let's shift gears here and, and let's talk about, you've got a depiction in here, the truth about online college, because many people believe, you know, you go to college, you pay your tuition, and it's been said on many mainstream stations throughout the years that the cost of college education is continually rising. But tell, give people a little bit of an overview on, the, on, on what it's really like in an online college where you've got, you know, you're just looking at the internet. I mean, it's not like you have to report to a class and there's a teacher there and, you know, people talk about different subjects. So, I mean, because basically the first line of this is that online college is Facebook for nerds. That's what <laughs> oh, it is. 
I could easily log in at my computer at home and go to class, just like you would log in on Facebook. And when you log into your classroom, it's just nothing more than a forum. Uh, you have a syllabus, which is about six pages of your assignments that you are to complete. Um, there are no instructional videos that lecture you on assignments or material that you should be learning. You're on your own. You are provided with a PDF copy of a textbook and the internet for research. Well, it's interesting that you mentioned that because I, I wanted to bring it up here in a little bit. You, you're provided with a PDF copy of a textbook. Yes. Not a textbook. No. But on, yet you're, you're required to purchase your, what they call books. Right. But they're really not books. No. Um, they're just a bunch of text that they throw up on a screen and you pay for it. But there are no video lectures. There are no webcams. There, there really literally is nothing. Um, and, and you, 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 you don't have, you have a PDF format. You have no books, yet you're paying for, you know, what they call books. Resource fee. Resource fee. Okay. Add that in, folks. Remember that. Resource fee. So, you, as we go through this, this little segment here about the truth about all, online college, you mentioned that it's like you are trapped in a bubble filled with hopes and dreams. Define that. I, I think I've got a little bit of an insight as to what you're speaking of, but, but I want to hear it in your words. You're trapped in a college filled with hopes and dreams of being successful one day, but it just never happens. All I wanted was a career. I wanted to be able to use my education out there. So you're, start, you're, you're in this position where you're getting your bills paid. And of course, you have that thought in the back of your mind before you enrolled in this, that you were out spending your time, your gas, your effort, your, your looking for a job, always had to be on your best behavior. So right now, you're sitting in this position where, yes, you're getting your bills paid and you're getting online and you're doing this for the idea that in the future, Everything's going to be alleviated. Did you have? Did you give any thought at that time to the idea that there's a student loan debt that is building up in the background that someday you would have to pay back? I did. However, my financial counselor advised me that my financial aid, I don't have to pay back. Those are Pell Grants. Those come from the government. A lot of the money I was receiving, to be 100% uh, about it, uh, $25,000 in debt came from the government and Pell Grants. Okay. So you were, you were told by the, the ed enrollment advisor that part of this money didn't have to be paid back. Right. Was that true? That is true. That is true. As long as you don't commit any felonies, you're not convicted of anything like drugs or while you're going to college, um, correct. Okay. Okay. So, so moving forward here, it says, uh, uh, going down to the job search, although you couldn't get a job, you were still under the impression that after post-graduation, you could have any job you wanted because that's what the enrollment advisor had kind of placed in your mind. Is that correct? Yeah. Uh, and you, you also go on to say that during your job search, you had discovered that even with a four-year degree, you did, you still didn't qualify for anything in the psychology field, which is where you had moved, shifted your, your focus, correct? Right. Okay. Uh, and so uh, it says, looking back on it, it seems tantamount to a merry-go-round spinning just a bit too fast for a safe exit. And those enrollment advisors seem to always be holding that safety net, i.e. what we had spoken about before of as long as you were here and as long as you can study, uh, continued to study, your bills were being paid. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a merry-go-round that you kind of can't get off of. Huh? It's just enough, though. It's just enough to get the bills paid. I mean, granted, it didn't pay. You weren't going after the movies on no, Saturday night. No, definitely not. <laughs> I wasn't buying my food or anything like that. Okay. So and it goes on. I mean, you know, you, you went back to the Internet jobs, the career builder, the monster, the Craigslist ads, and you were sending off resume after resume. And we're, this is talking, we're talking about months went by. I mean, yes. you're doing this for, for months. And it says you went back on the phone to your academic counselor. You spent an hour on the phone with her and eight hours revising your resume, uh, according to the University of Phoenix guidelines. And again, months passed. You were still unemployed with no phone calls for a job interview. And so, again, we're talking about folks over a period of another two years or thereabouts, mm -hmm. right, looking for uh, a bachelor's degree. So... 
Again, you're approaching graduation with no job, no sign of any opportunities. And so approaching graduation, well, what happened then? Just You're, you're just about ready to graduate from your four-year degree, and wouldn't you know it? I get a call from the enrollment advisor. <laughs> Are we starting to see a pattern here, folks? Um, okay, so you get a call from the enrollment advisor. Uh, and you read it, wrote it, it's like it's on their calendar. Now, are you starting to, uh, are there any suspicions starting to arise? Yes, here? at this point there is. Okay, go ahead. You're sitting on the fence. I'm sitting on the fence. Um, here I am about to graduate with my four-year degree, which is what most employers go after. And there's no jobs in the psychology field for me because I don't have five years experience or a license. So... We start talking about, oh, my other interests again, you know, my hobbies, what I've been doing for the past two years. Same thing you were talking about the first time yeah. when the guy was just angelic. And that friendly was... conversation. <laughs> you know? Yeah, okay. Um, and at this point, I'm just kind of laughing to myself. Like, is this a joke? You know, and I, and I let her know what I had been going through, you know, this whole time. Mm -hmm. And... Well, ultimately, <laughs> ultimately, uh, you you wrote in here that the enrollment advisor she listened as always and was seemingly empathetic to your disappointment, which evidently now you're starting to realize they always are. Yes, they're looking for that that switch in gears where they can take that and turn it around to get you to continue your scholastic endeavor because now you're starting to think, well, maybe. No, I don't know. I'm maybe putting words in your mouth, but you're starting to think maybe they're getting a commission on this. Did you think that at that point? Um, at that point, I wasn't really sure if it was a commission-based thing. It's oh. education, so you think salary normally, oh. you know. Oh. Okay. Um, I've, I always thought, you know, maybe it was just her job to try to continue my education because, you know, what I've always been told is if you have a master's degree, you can get a job anywhere. Well, Everybody will hire you. Yeah, you said that in here, a master's degree because you can pretty much have your pick of the crop uh, with any job that you desire. That's And she told you she that. She told me that. Okay. Now, and you you basically at that point in time were kind of despondent with the whole thing, saying, you know, I'll think about it. Yeah. And so I, you didn't make a commitment. I wasn't sure at that time. So you hung up the phone. What happened next? Um, I got an email a week later. Okay. Well, that says she called you back a week later, but uh, it doesn't matter. She communicated with you a week later. It, Go ahead. She communicated with me a week later to find out if I had made a decision or not, whether or not to go back to or continue on with my master's program. But this time, I qualified for free books during my master's You're program. talking about those PDF files that yeah. really aren't books to begin with. But. Well, you know, <laughs> she saved me $90 a class. Okay. So... At that point, I was like, you know, that's great. Every little bit counts right now. And she explained to me that all of my res my resource fees that I was once paying in my bachelor's program and my associate's program would now come back to me in the form of a refund check. So she's using this. Basically, this is the what she had told you pushed you over the edge and caused you to make the decision to go ahead and go back for your master's degree. Right. Also with the <laughs> idea in the mind that because you're going to have a master's degree, everybody's going to basically be you know, falling at your doorstep to hire you. I, I can pretty much pick and choose what job I want with a master's degree. Okay. It's how she explained it to me. Okay, so now we've gone through the associate's tier. We've gone through the, the, the bachelor's tier all the time. Just, you know, you're, you're, you're getting more and more money, and I don't know, you know, call me naive, but does the government give you this money every month? Uh, is there is a lump sum that they send you every year? How does that work? Or is it every quarter? It's every four classes, uh, which is about six months. About six months. So you get a, a lump sum of money every six months. For, right. Okay. Uh, so... You've, you've, you've gone through three tiers now. You've gotten a lump sum of money for, did it take you two years to go through your associates? Was that right? It's a, yeah, it was about two years each program. And then the next, two years each program. So you're, you're four years into this, and now you're into the third tier, and you're getting these increments of money that are deposited into your 
mailbox or bank account or whatever uh, for all this time. And now you're in the third phase and you've already expressed, and I'm just going off the top of my head from reading this article, you've already expressed your disappointment with these people more than once. Yes. Okay. So do you feel like it's possible that, you know, when they were calling you just coincidentally towards each graduation that they literally had you on a calendar? Yeah. Okay. Do you also feel like based upon the disappointment and what you had shared with them that they probably were getting the idea that we're not going to get any more money out of this lady? Um, Definitely. <laughs> and, I, and I say that, folks, to say this because to, uh, well, as you write in here, to your astonishment, they, they gave you an assignment to do. And this is when you're headed for your master's degree. They gave you an assignment that was uh, basically had to write a paper on the difference between not profit and for profit organizations. Yeah. And you go on to say here that uh, let's see, you you during your exploration you learned that non profit and profit organizations also included colleges and universities. Yes, that's true. So once you figured that out. Now you're going down the rabbit hole. It says, of course, this sparked my interest, and I'm reading from your, your article. Of course, this sparked my interest, so I read more, and before you know it, I was sucked into an extremely enlightening fishing expedition. Well, what did you find on that expedition? How many fish did you catch there, Jessica? I found out the University of Phoenix is a for-profit organization, and I did a comparison in my state against the University of Phoenix and WGU Indiana, which is another online college that offers the MBA program, and they are a non-profit organization. Okay, so WNG, is that what it is? WGU Indiana, WG a non-profit organization. Okay, and then we've got the University of Phoenix, which is a profit organization. Right. And by the way, folks, as you'll notice, we're putting some documents up here as we go through this, which are attached to the article in here. And uh, you found in doing this that the University of Phoenix, being a for-profit corporation, was doing what? Was charging you what? Almost $5,000 more per term. That's $10,000 a year times six years of college equals $60,000 more than a non-profit organization. That's over half of my student loan debt. So, in finding this out, you write in here that you were sick to your stomach, I which was. I could imagine anybody <laughs> would be. I was very sick to my stomach. I wanted to go vomit. I was gonna, I'd be grabbing the toilet for a couple <laughs> of days. But, but that, that said, uh, do you think, in hindsight, that it's possible that they knew that you, they weren't going to get any more money out of you? And they deliberately gave you this assignment kind of to, I don't know, say, sucker, you know, or what? Well, the assignment wasn't on universities. It was about organizations in general. It could have been anything. It could have been Walmart, Target, you name it, car washes. Mm -hmm. I happened to stumble across something about for-profit organizations and universities. That was by accident on my behalf. I see. Okay. So in stumbling across this all of a sudden your eyes are awakened to what they are really doing. And then all of this stuff, and I'm just using my own you know, synopsis, kind of fit into play. It all came together. The puzzle started putting itself together. It started making sense. And you also depict in here, of course, we're putting some of these uh, documents up here for the sake of the viewing audience. You said on here that, that an online instructor at the University of Phoenix makes up to $171,000 a year. That's what it says. And these are people who are in charge of making sure you've, you're reading the PDF file. I mean, what, what is their job? They sit at home. They don't go to call. They don't, they're not going into a classroom. No, they sit at home like students do online and they grade assignments. Um, they format the syllabus according to their schedule. So they're, you know, when assignments are due, it fits according to when they have time to grade. Mm -hmm. um, and then they also, you know, we have discussion questions every week where that's your attendance. That's how you're counted for, for your attendance. And she'll post a question in a forum that you have to respond to and discuss the topic with other students in the class. 
That's all it is. So, in your estimation, are you thinking that these people could actually do that job in what? 20 hours a week? 15 hours a week? What? Oh, part-time. Part-time? Yeah. Okay. And you don't, do you know what credentials, or if any, and I'm just, I'm going over the top here, do you know what credentials, if any, it takes uh, for them to qualify for a position such as this to make $3,500 a week to sit at home and grade a few papers and put a syllabus out there once in a while? They require a master's degree and five years experience. Okay. So the key is getting that five years experience, right? Yes. All right. Okay. So... You go on to say here, let's see, you didn't receive a good grade on the paper. Um, your paper was finished and you were disgusted. You didn't receive a good, oh, you received a good grade I on did. the paper. Okay. But as we go on here, now now you did this paper. Now you're again, once again, remember the tiers. We have the associate's degree, we have the master's degree. Now we're up to the master's degree. Now we're getting ready to graduate. After all this time and so much money being put in, we're getting ready to graduate. And you go on to say that you had straight B's throughout grad school, and the exceptional A. Once in a while, you'd get an A. Okay, I but think the, I had one. But your grade point average was a three or over, a little over three. It, yeah, it was always over three. Okay. And so you, you depict in here that towards the end, when you're graduating, there was one class that, for whatever reason, you had problems with, and it was a difficult class. Uh, and I guess you didn't like this guy that sat home making his $171,000 a year. <laughs> he didn't like me. He didn't like you. No. Was there a reason? I, mean, I don't didn't know. know you personally. I mean, I don't know how you can discriminate. Over how those. could you not like you? I mean, look at you. He but of course, see me. Yeah, he never met <laughs> you, so there you are. I mean, it's like, folks, it's like going out, you know, and putting in your resume, and you've done this before, going Craigslist, Monster.com, and you throw in a resume, and, you know, it goes on top of a thousand other resumes, and they never really see who you are, okay? They just pick one out and say, oh, that looks good. So that's what they were doing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so uh, you, this difficulty that you had with this one class, ultimately, you had mentioned in here that, Normally, when, when you're through with an assignment, it takes them three days and you get your results. This one took eight days. Yeah. And when you got the results back, and then you also go in here to say that you gave this 110% effort because it was a difficult class and you were so close to graduating that you knew that you had to put forth the extra effort. Oh, yes. And at the end, when all the chips are in and everything's said and done, eight days later, you come back or they come back in this class you get a D, which drops your grade point average, coincidentally, folks, just below <laughs> what it takes to graduate. <clears throat> Isn't that a coincidence? So now you it drops below the 3.0 grade average, and what does that mean to you? I mean, what happens if that happens? Now you have a 2.9 which is just a little bit below what it takes. Yeah. What well, happens? Let me mention at first, I was more excited about that D than I'd ever been in any grade in my life. I was proud of that D. I got a letter stating that I, I was on academic probation. Because you got a D. I got a D. Okay. And it dropped my grade point average below a 3.0, therefore I am now ineligible to attend my commencement ceremony, the cap and gown, and I cannot receive my degree. You don't get a degree, you can't do your cap and gown, and that means that all the money that's been coming in for all this time is basically what? You just have to pay um, it back, but there's nothing to show for right. it. So you can't put master's degree on your resume, right. which is another story in itself. And we'll get there, but in the meantime. Right. <laughs> okay, so anyway, back to this. Uh, you you had, at the time, a significant, I'm not going to use the exact figure, they can go in and read it, but you had a significant amount of student loans. Yeah. They dropped you down to a 2.9, wouldn't allow you to graduate, put you on academic probation, and then they said, oh, by the way, go ahead. Since I couldn't afford $2,000 out of pocket, um, oh, wait a minute. Oh, the two. Oh, I see. Okay, yeah. so you could either pay to retake the classes out of pocket, which would cost you twenty two hundred and twenty dollars. Yeah. Or. Or. You, or you could go ahead. I could. Um, I could do a concentration program, which would add four classes to my degree, and another ten thousand five hundred dollars. So your choice. Nothing out of pocket, though. 
No, of course. No. They're, you're going to get more of so uh, another okay. loan <laughs> so, that, so that the government can later come after yes. you and say, hey, you know, we want the money back. Uh, story <laughs> for another day, folks. That'll be a different show. Okay, but anyway. So you, you have a choice. You can either A, pay out another $2,220, or you can B, take four additional classes and add another $10,500 as a gamble to your already existing student loan. And so... What happened then? I mean, you obviously were a bit aggravated. Oh, that's that's an understatement. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. So anyway, basically, <laughs> you were hung out to dry with a significant student loan, and your their options that they gave you were to either retake the class that you got a D, which cost you twenty two hundred twenty dollars, or you could go take four additional classes and add this to whatever. Uh, and it was ten thousand five hundred. It was a ten thousand five hundred dollar gamble. Uh, and so with that, uh, you had to do one of these two options or you couldn't even get the degree of which you had borrowed so much money to get. Right. I had a roadblock. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, and, and uh, needless to say, you were a little bit aggravated, I would think. <laughs> More than just a little bit at this point. <laughs> More than just a little bit. Well, we're not going to, you know, go into any, you know, detail about no. What happened when you were throwing stuff and screaming and cussing and so forth? <laughs> no. Okay. We'll leave that out. So, so, what did you do then? So, after all the stuff settled, right? Then you're going. You 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 mentioned that you take the opportunity to let the academic counselor know that your options, of the options, or what your idea of the options are that the university had for you, and that you'd be contacting the attorney general. Yes, with the evidence that I submitted to the university about my grade dispute. And their synopsis or their conclusion to your grade dispute is that you didn't have enough evidence. Right. All right. So not having enough evidence, but then threatening to contact the attorney general. Uh, a week later, you got an email from your financial counselor advising me. Uh, let's see. She says that I did not give her the opportunity to discuss any further options with the manager. But now... That she has, they are willing to work something out. Now, this was after you threatened them with the attorney general. Yes. And All of a sudden, mysteriously. And we'll be putting this email up on the screen for your enjoyment. Um, all of a sudden, they can work with me. They couldn't work with you before. But no, but I had to call and figure out how they were going to work with me because they didn't want to do it in writing, and they let me retake that class for free. Is that right? And they did. And what kind of grade did you get? I got a B. Is that? <laughs> Just like usual. How amazing, isn't Just it? Like I mean, usual, I yes. That it's the American way. All right, so <laughs> so their solution was that you were now uh, allowed to retake the class, didn't have to put out any more money, and you ultimately got your degree. Yes. Okay. So five years plus of this, and you wind up with a degree, but you're walking on eggshells the whole time, becoming increasingly more and more in debt, and then it just seemed like, coincidentally, at every step of the way where you would run into problems, they were always there to help you if you would just spend more money. Yes, right. right. And so the epilogue to this, and I mean to mention, I'm going to share a few of your words here. Millions of Americans share the same dream. I mentioned this at the beginning of the program. Go to college, get a degree, start a career, buy a house, start a family. You're 33 years old. Uh, you say you, you have that dream as well. You went to college. You achieved a master's degree. You have a house. You have a family. The only thing missing from the equation now is you don't have a career. Right. You have no job. Right. After all this time, all this money, and all these promises, and all this emotional building up of saying, you can be anything. Be all that you can be. Right? Right. Something like that. Yeah. Okay. I so, am a phoenix. <laughs> <laughs> so with that being said, I have to, I have to ask you. I'm going to read a little bit more here. You ask, why did your phone stop ringing when you added college education to your resume? Why did your opportunities become more and more limited the further that you progressed in your education? Why were you told numerous times by underling employees, in other words, people that work there would accept an application or a resume and then hand it off to their boss, say, oh, well, he's out of the office right now. When get back to the land. You know, that's... <laughs> Why were you told numerous times by underling employees when turning in these applications that you might consider removing your degree from your resume as their employer may consider you to be overqualified for the position? What were you, how did you feel about that? 
At first, I thought it was a joke. You know, like, she can't be serious. There's no way. This is impossible. Um, but then it kind of clicked because it kept happening. And more and more people started telling me, you know, this is true. I have friends who, you know, they have real jobs. They have, they are bosses. They have bosses who tell them this, these things. You know, they work together. They talk. Um, the underling employee, and I've been there, folks, a long time ago when the earth was green. You know, I, I, I was in a car. I thought. I don't play well in other people's sandboxes, okay, but <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, you have this corporate mentality, and it's basically, you know, it's kind of, I don't know, propagandized into you, or it's legislated, or it's, it, it's you know, bludgeoned into you over time, uh, and people that are in a corporate structure, a lot of times, they're, well, they walk on eggshells, so there's not a lot of things that they can do or say without offending somebody or, you know, being accused of whatever, sexual harassment, whatever. But uh, you have situations where you go apply for a job and you have an employer that isn't there. They never are. Uh, they're always, well, he's in a meeting or, you know, well, no, he'll be back Monday. I mean, how many times have you folks heard that? If you've ever been in the, in the, uh, uh, the arena of job hunting, you know, we've all heard that. So you go in there and you hand it to an underling who takes it and smiles in your face and says, yes, we'll make sure they get it. They don't tell you at what part of the stack they're going to give it to you. It's going to be down there, number 8,832. But still, it's going in the stack somewhere. Uh, that said, uh, you, let's see. I wanted to go on and read here. You, you you said that you had a back. You have a background in sales. Uh, you grew up around <laughs> grew up around your father, who uh, was a top salesman in his profession, having experience in the sales industry. Uh, and now your senses are very up to par when it came to spotting salesmen. And this particular woman had no idea how to alleviate your query with a reasonable answer. Okay, that's another topic. But you ultimately found out that, from at least from your experience, that these enrollment advisors that are paid forty-one thousand dollars a year are—that's just a nice word for empathetic salesperson. Sales representative. Okay, sales representative. So they're sales representative. Yeah. Which would explain why, at the beginning of this interview, I had uh, shared with you, the listening audience, six emails in the course of five hours trying to get me. And by the way, the cell phone calls, too. I get at least one or two of them a week from some nice lady out in wherever it is trying to get me. Have you ever thought about furthering your education? I always tell them, no, I don't want an education. I like being stupid. But other than that, uh, <laughs> you know, it's constant. It goes on constantly. And... Um, the, the, the trailer that was put up on the AmericanAwakening.org with Diane Sawyer, and I believe at that particular writing it was uh, a year or two ago, you know, the student loan debt in this country is $950 billion. So, in looking at that, yours is just a little snippet right, <laughs> of what right. that is. However, you know, from the point of view of having to pay that back, and it's an enormous amount of money. And if you can't get the job of which you went to school to get, and you have to settle for something that like half the population has. I, I went through and looked at some of the statistics on this vote. And college graduate, at least half of the college graduates in this country are have, have had to move back in with their parents. There's another significant percentage that you'll find sometimes it's rare, because if you've ever pulled up to a drive up window at Wendy's or McDonald's, okay, every once in a while you'll find a college grad working in there. Uh, most of the time you might find somebody at the drive up window that can't speak very good English, but, you know, sometimes you run into that. So at this juncture, from your experience, Jessica, in this whole journey through the college degree, in your own words, if somebody out there has a daughter, son, you know, uh, themselves, if, they're, if they, their job is downsized and they're out in the, uh, uh, in the field of endeavor, what would be your recommendations to them? Well, I'm not going to sit here and tell anyone not to go to college because that's not what I'm here for. Do your research. Get online, you know, go into places and really research what you're going to go to school for. I mean, what what do you want to do? And look up, don't just look up colleges, look up jobs. Look up the jobs that you feel you may be interested in doing in the future because more than likely you're going to be sold on something that you weren't looking for to begin with. Um, would you also tell them, and I think 
you know, as an interviewer, as a talk show host, I'm not a real smart guy, but you know, the wisest of the wise have come on my show in the past. They, uh, in the past, they throw a bunch of stuff against the wall. Some of it sticks, okay? But in light of what stuck with me out of this article, uh, would you say, would it be safe to say that you want to take a very close look at for-profit as opposed to non-profit, what classes they offer, and how inexpensively, if you decide to go back to college, that you can get through it? Here's the situation. I have about $100,000 in student loan debt, and half of that money went to the University of Phoenix for profit. What upsets me most about my situation isn't the fact that employers out there don't want anything to do with my resume. Honestly, I'm not worried about it right now. What upsets me most is that I put myself in debt $50,000 so this University of Phoenix could sell people like you, the public, by television commercials, internet ads, emails, all kinds of millions and millions of dollars each year spent by the University of Phoenix on advertising. They took my money to sell you to be in my position. And I am here today to stand forward as a master's graduate of the University of Phoenix. I am not proud to be a Phoenix. I would not recommend the University of Phoenix to anyone out there. Please, I beg you, do your research. Do not end up in this position. And there's been such a plethora of jobs that have been open to you uh, since you've gotten this degree, ultimately. And I might go on to say, is it, am I correct? Your, your, your repayment schedule starts, what is it, six months and one day after your graduation? Yes. So you're looking at a repayment schedule of the cost of a Mercedes Benz with all the frills on a lease basis <laughs> to pay back for a little piece of paper that you got from some people that you've been told on numerous occasions to take it off your resume to have a better chance of getting a job. Yes. This concludes our show for today. But I'd like to take a moment and reflect back to that ABC News clip you watched earlier. $900 billion in student loan debt in America, and that's over half of the credit card debt in this country. That's a serious problem. If we don't do something about this, those numbers are going to continue to grow. Eventually, they're going to double, and they're going to triple, and then we're going to have a crisis on our hands. What can we do to stop this? The problem in this country is for-profit universities. These universities are taking advantage of students that have hopes and dreams of an education, a career, and a future. They're not getting that future. You can make a difference. You don't even have to leave your house to make a difference. All you have to do is take the initiative to share this story. Share it on Facebook, share it on Twitter, YouTube, wherever you want to share it. That $900 billion number is never going to shrink unless people are aware of what these for-profit organizations are doing to people like you and I. Let's make a difference. Let's take a stand and put our foot down and take our country back. We value education. We want a future for ourselves, for our children, for our grandchildren. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Jessica Clowers, and this is The American Awakening.